So deduce the intermolecular forces based on structure and formula. So intermolecular forces are the forces between the molecules, between this one and that one, not the ones within the molecule. And we're only going to be talking about simple molecules here, simple covalent molecules, not diamond, that's a giant macromolecule. So a quick review, the strongest of the intermolecular forces is hydrogen bonds, followed by dipole-dipole, dipole-induced dipole, and finally London dispersion forces. These are all van der Waals bonds. A quick recap. If a hydrogen is directly bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, then you have the potential for hydrogen bonds. Note that this is not the hydrogen bond, nor is that hydrogen bonds are intermolecular between one molecule and the next. And who knows what's there? Maybe it's another hydrogen, maybe it's carbon. Looking at dipole-dipole, let's look, for example, at carbon monoxide. That has a dipole. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And if I put that next to another carbon monoxide, you can see that they behave like little magnets now. The positive uh, part of this molecule is carbon, and it's going to be attracted to the negative part of the other molecule, which is oxygen. So these are the dipole-dipole forces. Dipole-induced dipole, if you've got something, again, like a carbon monoxide, and it's next to, let's say, helium, then since this end of the molecule is slightly negative, because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, now the electrons in this helium atom are going to be slightly more likely to be on this side, away from the oxygen on the carbon monoxide. So dipole-induced dipole. And so how is this an intermolecular force? Well, I've got the little negative here, little bit positive here, little bit negative there, little bit positive there. There's the dipole-induced dipole. And there are videos on, on all of these. And finally, London dispersion forces. Let's look at helium again. Let's say the electrons on helium are just instantaneously on that side. That means the electrons on this helium are more likely to be over there. Now, now, why would they line up like that? Well, don't forget, helium's got a plus two and a minus and a minus. That's the charge on the nucleus. And over here, plus two. And these electrons, where are they going to be slightly more likely to be? Just for an instantaneous fraction of a second, they're more likely to be here because they want to be close to the positive two nucleus there. And so minus plus, minus plus, there's going to be an interaction, a London dispersion force. So how do you know uh, which intermolecular force uh, is going to be present? Well, you need to look at the molecular geometry, which is what shape does the molecule have, and the polarity of the bonds, which tells you which end of the bond is a little bit negative or a little bit positive, or maybe, maybe it's neutral. Looking at ammonia first of all, ammonia, NH3, the electronegativity of nitrogen is 3, and of hydrogen is 2.2. Molecular geometry is trigonal-based pyramid. And nitrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen has a higher electronegativity, which means the electrons in these covalent bonds are going to be towards the nitrogen, making the top of this molecule a little bit negative and the bottom a little bit positive. So I have the ability to make hydrogen bonds here. Any time a hydrogen is covalently bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, hydrogen bonds are going to be made. Note that this is not a hydrogen bond. It's just a regular covalent bond. But when one molecule comes close to the next one, ah, now this little bit positive hydrogen is going to be attracted to this little bit negative nitrogen. You're going to have a hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bonds are the strongest of the intermolecular forces. So maybe uh, you'd expect ammonia to be a liquid, since the bonding is quite strong here at room temperature, or at least would be easily liquefied if you chilled it. Nasty. Well, let's look for the electronegativity We're on page 8 of the IB table. Hydrogen's 2.2 and sulfur's 2.6. 
So 2.2 for hydrogen and 2.6 for sulfur. All right, so it is a bent molecule or a V-shaped molecule like that, 104 and a half degrees bond angle. The top's gonna to be a little bit negative since sulfur is the most electronegative of the two atoms. And the bottom's gonna be a little bit positive. So when the molecules come towards each other, they're gonna stack up like that, like that, like that. This positive, little bit positive, is gonna to wanna to go towards that little bit negative. And this is just a regular dipole-dipole attraction. It's not hydrogen bonding because sulfur does not cause hydrogen bonds to be induced as an intermolecular force. Next one is hydrogen cyanide. Why is it called cyanide? Well, if you sniff it, you turn cyan. Just a rather lovely shade of blue. So hydrogen cyanide, checking out the electronegativities, you've got 2.2. Where did I put them? Oh, here we go. Uh, 2.6 and 3.0. It's a linear molecule, and which end of it's gonna be a little bit negative, if any? The nitrogen end, so this is the nitrogen end. So they're gonna line up like this. This end's a little bit negative, that end's a little bit positive, a little bit positive, a little bit negative, and you're gonna have this attraction. So what sort of attraction's that? Well, the hydrogen isn't attached to the nitrogen, so it's just a regular dipole-dipole attraction. And what also needs to be mentioned is in every case, there is London dispersion forces. Anything with electrons has London dispersion forces. And in fact, more electrons gives more London dispersion forces. So in all cases, this is present. So why don't we mention it? Well, we only mention it when it's the only intermolecular force. It's such a small intermolecular force, such a small attractive force compared to the others that uh, the IB normally ignores it. So let's try a boron trihydride. Wow, that's actually rather clever. So this is a trigonal planar molecule, 120 degrees. And you know what? It doesn't really matter about the bond polarity because even if all the bonds are polar, it won't mean that one end of the molecule is a little negative and one end a little positive because the bond polarities will cancel out. So what does that mean? Well, actually, boron is electronegativity 2 and hydrogen... So that means that hydrogen is going to be a little bit more negative. So let's draw one there one there, and one there. Positive in the middle a little bit, negative on the outsides. Now, one end of this molecule isn't a little negative and the other end a little positive, so it has no dipole. A dipole, one end's negative a little bit and one end's a little bit positive. So essentially, if these have no dipoles, then there's no dipole, dipole, there's no dipole, induced dipole. We're coming down to London dispersion forces, which is the weakest one. Now, I've never seen boron trihydride, but I'm pretty sure it must be a gas, since they barely attract each other. Next up is butane. And again, this is a very symmetrical molecule, whatever these are. These are, in fact, carbons and hydrogens, but one end is not going to be more negative than the other because of the symmetry here. So butane... So this again must be London dispersion forces. Now these are sausagey molecules, and if you remember, sticky sausage, non-sticky balls. So butane are like sausages, and so there's London dispersion forces where they interact like that, where they touch each other. But if I was to say 2-methylpropane, 
Well, that's also going to be London dispersion forces, but 2-methylpropane actually is not quite so sausagey. So 2-methylpropane is more of a sphere, so sticky sausage, non-sticky balls. And so these only really have London dispersion forces where they touch, which is smaller because they're more spherical. But anyway, London dispersion forces for butane. I got this wrong a few years ago on the IB test. pH3. Now, phosphorus is in group 15 just like nitrogen, so I assumed it was going to be the same as ammonia, uh, where this is a little bit negative, that's a little bit positive, it's polar. No, 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 no. This one's a trick. pH3 does have the same molecular geometry, trigonal base pyramid, but... Phosphorus and hydrogen had the same electronegativity, 2.2. So this molecule is completely non-polar. There is no dipole. And so, again, London dispersion forces are the interaction. Uh, so I'd imagine there should be a gas, since these barely attract each other. It's the weakest of all the intermolecular forces. Four. What the hell am I thinking? London dispersion forces. Next up... is CSO. Now that's like carbon dioxide, CO2, but with one of the oxygen substituted for a sulfur. Now, looking at the periodic table, fluorine has the highest electronegativity and oxygen is touching fluorine here, so even without a periodic table, I know that oxygen has the highest electronegativity of all of these three. So I know that oxygen is going to have the highest electronegativity. So the red's oxygen, that's going to be a little bit negative, a little bit negative, which means the sulfur is going to be a little bit positive, a little bit positive, and we're going to have dipole, dipole. So let's look at three uh, evil ones. So methane tetrol, well, that's just carbon with four hydroxyl groups attached. So I imagine that would have a very high melting point, boiling point, very strong intermolecular forces because there are at least four places for hydrogen bonds to form. I'd expect this to be a, a viscous liquid or a, or a jelly-like solid. Then let's look at uh, Buckminster fullerene. They've asked about this one before. I always wonder if I could call it bleepminster buckerine and get away with it. Well, that would be swearing. Anyway, that's C60. And uh, that's London dispersion forces. It's that big sphere with the pentagons and hexagons in it. Uh, the IB have asked that one before, so you need to know that one for sure. And they do like to ask one uh, with isomers. And this is the one, uh, and it's got a relatively straightforward trick in it to avoid it. So there's the isomer, C2, so there's the formula, C2H6O. There's only two isomers. The first one is ethanol, well, straightforward, isn't it? That's hydrogen bonding produced from that hydroxyl group. And then I'm going to do it wrong. Looks like it should be this one, which is an ether. And continuing to do it wrong... You might think that that's a little negative, high electronegativity, little positive, little positive. It looks like it's non-polar because one end is not a little positive and the other a little negative. No, 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 this is all wrong. That's not the shape. It's not linear. This central oxygen has two lone pairs and two bonded pairs. So that's a bent shape or a V shape. So let's fix it. It's not a linear molecule. which means that the next ether to come along 
is also going to have a dipole and they're going to be attracted. So there's dipole-dipole attraction between oxygen and methyl in different molecules. We're nearly done. Let's, let's, and let's look at some of the nastiest ones I can think of. Uh, we've got methan tetrol.